we need to think about what we can actually change, what we can affect in an economically viable way. And what I mean by that, and it sounds awful, but we're going to have to make a decision on, on which diseases are, uh, shall we say, more important or less important. And none are, import none are less important. But I think what I'm trying to say here is that I think we have to think carefully about what we can eradicate and what that allows in terms of uh, the better health that is imparted upon the population, what they can then give back and contribute to society. So I think it's a two-way thing. That's very much how I look at this. Um, so beyond mere profit, it's not actually about trying to make money out of uh, the uh, creation of a new treatment, whatever it may be, humanizing science. But what it is to me is, is an understanding that whatever we do costs money. So we have to assess that against the, the money that we put in to what we ultimately get out in terms of a society and gives back to that society and allows it to grow and develop. So that's what I take from this. So um, we have uh, three, as usual, this, this conference doesn't really, really do anybody other who's not distinguished. So we have three distinguished panelists. Um, Zhuao at the end is uh, uh, a lovely man. I have met him several times. Um, he has been many things in his life. I'm, I'm not going to tell you about what he's been because he just told me something that I didn't know he was doing. So he's, it, well, if you, if, I think uh, Claudio is, it represents an advisor to the Italian, uh, is it trade mission or, or science or, yes. And, uh, and the lady to my immediate left, uh, Biana Papazov, Papazov, sorry, is uh, she's from, well, she's in Germany, but I believe you're Bulgarian. Is that correct originally? Yeah, right. So um, if I could ask each of you to uh, perhaps, Dwao, well, if you could expand on, on, on what your background is for just a minute, just to give people in the audience an idea, a flavor of what you've done. Some of you may have seen Dwao well before, some of you may have seen Claudio before, uh, but uh, I think that's a good place to start. Um, so Dwao, well, please. Uh, well, I, I'm a business person, uh, studied business, uh, have an MBA, and now <laughs> recently I went into a master's degree in env environmental science. And uh, so I'm going to talk to you about that. Uh, I've been uh, in several areas and doing several businesses, several deals, uh, and several capacities, so uh, I'm kind of not going to bore you with that. <laughs> Thank you very much. Nice to be here. <laughs> Claudio. Thank you. Uh, I, was, uh, I was running a consulting company uh, for 20 years in the domain of uh, uh, strategic advisory and communication in, uh, in terms of new technologies and innovation. I, I was appointed as an advisor for the Italian Agency for Innovation, a position which I left uh, some months ago and now I'm working as an independent consultant for uh, Italian institutions, uh, uh, companies, uh, uh, financial institutions, and so on. Okay, thank you. Uh, I want uh, to use the opportunity to say thank you that I'm allowed to be the third time in Alexandria, and I'm very happy because uh, thanks the way how the people here are listening, I. Uh, uh, I take my uh, my subject, and uh, I'm very happy again to have the impulse of the auditions. I'm a philosopher. I uh, I'm coming from Bulgaria originally, and uh, after the political turn, I stayed in Switzerland. I was philosopher in Bulgarian, uh, and I know what is uh, used uh, East Europe Spring. And uh, that's why I have so much empathy to Arab Spring. And then uh, in Switzerland, I teach ethics and uh, science and uh, ecology. And um, I am participant in different projects about uh, communication between science and audience. Thank you. OK, um, thank you very much. Uh, I, uh, some of you may have seen me earlier. Most of you won't because we didn't have very many speakers in our earlier session, so that was when I was speaking, so I presume I didn't have anything interesting to say. Uh, so these speakers were interesting. But um, I, uh, I was a scientist. Um, I have 
a PhD and a postdoc and a, a fellowship. Um, I then worked in various forms of publishing and the biotechnology industry. Uh, and ultimately, I was CEO of a biotechnology investment group. Um, and now, I think some of you have heard my partner, Christian, was talking earlier. Uh, and he, we, we set up something called the Technology Transfer Summit, specifically to try and help uh, the issues of uh, upstream development, so early stage innovation and technology and how we get that out to a potential market. And I you know, hasten to add that word, potential. Not everything is possible. So I think back to this session. Claudio, I believe you're going to start us. Uh, we have three presentations. Please feel free, Claudio, please. But please feel free uh, to try and interact. I mean, I think you've been very good in all the sessions I've been to. I think it's very important. We, I keep hearing it from other speakers, but questions asked, wrong or rightly, good thing. No questions asked, bad thing. We don't learn anything, okay? We learn from you as well. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, you all. Uh, when I was asked to uh, give a presentation uh, <clears throat> on how technology could lead companies before beyond the mere profits, I felt very grateful because I considered these issues as a pivotal role uh, in the future of development uh, of our society. I was thinking that I would talk on CSR, which means corporate social responsibility, uh, but as usual, I was inspired by some of the speakers and their interesting lectures I was, ten I was attending here. For example, uh, I can't see him, but uh, Klaus Mann was very, very inspiring to me as of the CEO panel which was held yesterday in the afternoon where I made some reflections on uh, the debate on risk perception, uh, another issue which I consider very important as, the, as far as I consider it the main obstacle to the diffusion of the latest technology uh, in agriculture and healthcare. Then, as it always uh, happens when I'm attending BioVision, and I'm very happy uh, to say that is uh, the sixth edition of BioVision which I attend, um, I will add to my presentation a few remarks concerning the meaning of sustainable development, 25 years later, the release of the so-called Brundtland Report uh, in 87, 1987, and 20 years from the memorable lecture given by Professor Murray Gelman, uh, co-founder of the Santa Fe Institute uh, in California. So, what the population we know is rising we heard about the population rising up to 11 billion uh, by 2050. The climate change is threatening the environment and the agricultural system. That's all we heard in these days at the BioVision conference. And how will we feed anyone? How will we provide health care? Uh, how could we foster a sustainable economy, which is uh, the main topics of this session of the conference? Uh, how could we induce corporation to pursue not only mere profits. Uh, and moreover, how might a social concern became a business tool, because that's what we were discussing in the, in the, in the, in the, other, uh, in the other session we have had, we, we come in. How about risk perception, which is not so, uh, so easy to define? Excuse well, me, sorry to, Claudia, there are some seats at the front here. If you wish, please come down. Yeah. Sorry, Claudio. No, no, don't worry, don't worry, don't worry. So about risk perception, uh, which I was uh, thinking about last night, I found something I, I think is very, is very interesting. That is, uh, I will show you because it was, it was impossible to me uh, to let read this. And this is a very, very, very short movie a few seconds, which I hope most of you probably know. But I need volume also, if at all possible. Thank you. New York City in the year 2022. How about the sound? Nothing runs anymore. Nothing works. But the people are the same. 
And the people will do anything to get what they need. This is the police. What they need most is Soylent Green. The supply of Soylent Green has been exhausted. So this is a very interesting movie and it was very appreciated at the time. I don't know how, how many of you uh, have had the occasion to, to look at, but this is for uh, saying that something about, let me check this one, oh, okay. Um, this is a story of a uh, in, in, in the New York 2022, the Solent Green is a, is a tale about a dangerous path on which the world seemed to be set. Uh, the people subsist on uh, wafer-like reactions produced by the, the Solent Corporation, and the reactions are supposed to be made from plankton, but the corporation latest product has a sinister secret, which is uh, tables are made by human corpse and people who are manufactured uh, of those who elected the euthanasia. And uh, so this, uh, this is a, a story about uh, what the, f the fear could be in terms of risk perception and uh, how about business and how could business uh, is or not to, to blame for the state we are in or for creating uh, shareholder value or uh, for reporting just for quarterly profits. Thus, how can we say about investments in a long-term sustainability issues that will continue to be sacrificed where there is no immediate financial return to be made? This is a crucial point to me uh, because uh, <coughs> it avoids any, any possible sustainable development if it return is not immediate. So the movie I tried to show you was released five years after the best-selling book, uh, The Population Bomb, by Stanford professor Paul Ehrlich, uh, which warned, who warned the war is on the brink of a disaster doomed by high birth rates, low death rates, and environmental decline. This is clear that most reading uh, those predictions uh, now will scoff because uh, if predictions don't come to pass, people can end up dismissing very real problems. Climate change denialists in particular can size on failed prediction as proof that the phenomenon is not real. Um, and it was exactly 20 years ago, uh, spring 1992, that Murray Gellman gave a memorable lecture entitled Vision of a Sustainable World. And, uh, the lead was, what do we really mean by sustainable? And it was paradoxically citing uh, the Through the Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll, where Humpty Dumpty explained to Alice how the used word to mean anything he wanted paying them on Saturday night, the hand of the, week, the working week. And if Mr. Dump, uh, Mr. Dumpty were in charge today, a great many people would be paying wages to the word sustainable. And in fact, that 20 years later, not so many steps has been, has been done ahead uh, toward the sustainability, even if uh, in the meanwhile, uh, global knowledge has grown almost 10 times. Since then, as we know, um, knowledge is given to double each seven, eight years, uh, we, we, we should know 10 times more in the 20 years. For instance, I was really amazed uh, today by the Calvary of Gordon Rice, as I heard this morning, uh, and I was moved by the perseverance that Inco Potrinkus has showed in this last 14 years. So, was it due to risk perception, to bad risk perception? Was it only a bulk of ethical constraints? How long ignorance could persist 
in the 21st century. Um, next slides no, uh, can show what's the, the model. Uh, no, I don't need that, uh, just to show you what's the most common model of uh, uh, sustainable development, which is uh, the border on, between a broad societal economy, industry, environment, territory, uh, and is, uh, is made by inter a fair interaction the, between the first two, uh, the livability and the viability and so on. That's very common, there's nothing new. Um, let's, uh, let's get to, into the main topics, because I, I was very interested to add some small uh, consideration before introducing the corporate social responsibility because I think it's very, very strictly related to what I was just saying. Corporate social responsibility, CSR, does not have one particular definition. Some define it as an operating, as operating in a manner that meets or exceeds the ethical, legal, commercial, and public expectation that societies of business. Other define as a doing business in an ethical way that respect people, society, and environment. This is the, the latest, maybe, but we have other definition, almost similar by the World Bank, which is um, from the point of view of a company, describing a company obligation to be accountable uh, to all of its stakeholders and its operations and activity, for instance. Or uh, the British Council will define the CSR that it is continuing committing to by the business to behave fairly and responsible and contribute to economic development while improving the quality of life, the workforce, and their families as well as the local community, etc. <coughs> this is the model. You can see that this model of social responsibility is a is a little bit. Uh, more complex, that model of uh, sustainability which I, I showed before, because the interaction are more complex, are more and more complex, and uh, that is uh, more difficult to achieve when we have something to deal with as a, uh, the quality of management, for example, because the quality of management as a pivotal role in defining the corporate social responsibility. In general, uh, CSR refers to a collection of policies and practices linked to relationship with key stakeholder, stakeholders' values, compliance with legal requirements, respect for people, community, and environment, and the commitment of business to contribute to sustainable development, in fact. but. Why do I have to pretend to care? When I was, when I was mentioning the quality of management, that's the, the, the focus point about CSR, because the commitment of top management is not so high as we can imagine and, and, and how much we can hope in these days. Why do I have to pretend to care when I don't? And how can business minimize so, its negative impacts on society and the environment? What institutions, organizations, actions do need to deliver a sustainable society? Um, this is a question. How we can foster a commitment by the business to behave fairly, responsible, and to contribute to economic development, improving the quality of life of the workforce? Let's come to the other border, the other shore of the Mediterranean. Um, some, something has been done by the European Commission which uh, has been delivered in, the no in November 2011, some recommendations, and launched the project, uh, three-year project 2011-2014, uh, about um, CSR. And they have made a survey in those years, and they have concluded that something has been done in this direction. 
uh, they have five indicators of progress, which means uh, um, CSR principle to the United Nations Global Compact. And companies risen from six, uh, 600 in 2006, in 2006 to over 1,900 in 2011, and, and so on. Uh, as you can see, the Business Social Compliance Initiative uh, has grown 10 times in three years, for example. And the number of European enterprises publishing sustainable reporting according to guidelines of the Global Reporting Initiative rose from 2007 and 2006, in 270, pardon, 200 in 2006, to over 80, 150 in, uh, in uh, three, in four years. So the other main problem is uh, what's the role on a, on a, we have discussed about who is in charge, who should be in charge of regulations in most cases, uh, in the cases of patent Potenting in the cases of uh, 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 drugs uh, or uh, crops, uh, or uh, in this case, who should be in charge of uh, which authority? Public authorities should promote transparency, first of all, create market incentives for responsible business. This is a way in which the government could. Uh, introduce incentive for companies which are uh, fairly regulated, which operates in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in terms of sustainable development and uh, re socially responsible, and ensure the corporate accountability. And this could be controlled by consumers and investors. That's very easy because consumers cannot buy products for from uh, companies who are not socially responsible, for instance, or uh, investor could make the choice to do not invest in those kind of companies. And does enhance market reward for social responsible companies through consumption and investment in this case. And the media, the media, this very, that's very important, the media can raise awareness. Brief, this is the, the, briefly, this is the EC Agenda for Action 2011-2004, which is just for give you an idea of what could happen and the importance of this issue at the maximum level of a European government, because this is very important. So EC, um, the European Commission intend uh, enhancing the visibility of CSR and disseminating good practices improving self and co regulation processes because intent to involve companies in this process uh, by consumption, public procurement, and investment. For example, uh, as been decided by the European Commission not to buy more than 30% of every procurement they need by company will not uh, define, will not are under some standards they have already defined. So a corporation primary responsibility, there's a, a quotation, is to act on the behalf of shareholders who own the company, who want the best possible return on their investment, which is clear, three minutes, hmm? five minutes, okay. Almost, at the same time, managers are increasing increasingly face uh, pressure from government and the non-governmental organization, media and the public to take action that demonstrates the social conscience. But, you know, make sure everything is done ethically, within reason, of course, within reason. And that's very important because people, until now, in the boards, most of the boards are, uh, say, it's really impossible to make an overall judgment about company commitment to social responsible behavior and to sort the good companies from the bad. Because how can you define this quality? In other words, the market for virtue is not sufficiently important to make it in the interest of all firms to behave more responsible, more responsibly. So, conclusion, who determines what the social responsibility? Boundaries are flexible and it varies over time. 
three key components to what is normally considered CSR, environmental issues, labor issues, human rights. When corporate policies or activities go beyond what is mandated by law, that is the commonly thought as social responsible. But it's not, not enough, maybe, because what's the difference in the, among business ethics and corporate social responsibility? Business ethic connotates lawfulness that a company is obeying certain standards of regulations. CSR is voluntary, which is a, which is a problem maybe sometimes, uh, that serves an outside purposes. Is social responsibility, responsibility a fad? No, it's pretty resilient and enduring. More institution, institutionalized among certain firms or industries because it could be uh, very interesting from the point of view of business sometimes. A huge consulting business that is growing to accommodate growing, uh, to accommodate growing interest is a sign that CSR is resilient and enduring. Uh, well, this is a very important point. CSR and abusive labor practices or abuse of the environment overseas because these are indications that management strategies are beginning to expand the idea of social responsibility because beyond homeland. And the greater awareness is needed to monitor practices within the corporation and also those of suppliers, wherever they are. Because I can act fairly, but have some suppliers who does not. Well, let's go the perception. Well, so in conclusion, how can CSR contribute to sustainable development? By environmental protection, human rights, health promotion, educational, de educational development, and human disaster relief sometimes. And uh, unfortunately, it has some disadvantages because if a partner with a bad reputation is chosen, this will affect the name of your organization. And it could be that cost would pass it on the customers. Uh, normally it doesn't happen, but it could be because uh, uh, CSR has a cost in terms of choices, in terms of investments, in terms of many other, many other issues. And it could reduce economic efficiency and profit. So I, I stop right now and uh, of course questions are uh, welcomed and uh, thank you for your attention. Um, I think actually what we'll try and do is we'll try and go through all the talks and then have questions at the end so that we can keep them all together. So if you can keep, if you can write down the thoughts now so that you've got them while they're fresh. Um, I've got a couple too, Claudio, so uh, Dwao, are, are you going to come up please and, and continue the theme? I Thank hope. You. Claudio made a nice uh, entrance for my talk because he talked about philosophy of uh, social responsibility. I, I'm going to show you a case of that. You know? uh, what I'm going to talk to you is about uh, waste electric and electronic equipment, which is, uh, uh, and how do you capture that value of the B, and uh, how do we establish a viable, sustainable solution for that. Okay, what uh, are we talking about? You know, how many of you have one of those uh, equipment at home to be thrown away? No? Yes, thrown away. Yes, let's, let's, let's look at that. <laughs> yeah. you know, you know, everybody has thousands of little things at home, and uh, you know, uh, you know that you know old uh, telephones and say this, and you, and this has to be disposed in a socially uh, correct way, in an environmentally correct way. No? And, uh, really? Okay. Where are the cell sense factors? You know, you have, <clears throat> why do you want to throw them away? You know, well, they are old, technically unfeasible, the, 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 the software doesn't work anymore on them. You know, it has uh, aesthetics, they're kind of ugly, they're inefficient, they're slow, too slow. And the most thing is psychological. I think uh, I deserve an, an, a new iPad. Uh, and, 
And this is this is human. Uh, that's it. You know, uh, you know, it applies to clothes and uh, many things. You know, and, and so uh, what are the results of the improper disposal? You know, uh, you have first you have the material waste that where you lose everything that was inputted in that product, and you lose uh, all the the energy that was inputted and in the manpower and everything, and then the pollution. Uh, uh, the next slide shows you what what uh, what we waste. You know, uh, in a ton of <clears throat> in a ton of uh, of uh, we, you find uh, 350 to 400 kilos of steel. You know, copper 17 percent. You know, lead uh, two to three percent. I was surprised by that. I thought it was a lot more. Aluminum seven percent. You know, and uh, I think and then gold, zinc, silver, and platinum plus you know, several, several other rare airs and things that are valuable and, and in scarce uh, supply of today. And look at that. You know, that that's a picture that you see, you see you know, everywhere. We see that in Brazil, we see that in Egypt, we see that in Nigeria, and we see that in the United States. You know, people that you know, really you know, dump, uh, run you know, wrongly with what's the leftovers. Okay, uh, what should we do about that? You know, the first thing is that we don't need to change every day uh, for the next uh, new gadget. You know, we can keep our gadgets. My telephone has been lasting for four for years now and it's still working. You know, so that's a <clears throat> uh, then what you can do is reuse. You can you know exchange your telephone, send it to back to a. a, 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 a place that will work it on and put it, you know, re renew it. You know? Then you can, you know, have it dismantled and uh, you can <coughs> you reuse the, the compo components. All of these uh, present uh, no problems, uh, but uh, f force you can have the, the materials recycled, which is, which I'm going to talk pr pretty much about. Then uh, incineration with energy recovery, that's, uh, you know, incinerate, uh, that's uh, Industries that <coughs> do incinerate the, with, the, with the, the waste and uh, recover the energy through uh, new electricity and generating electricity. Yeah? That's it. And the last thing is landfill. You don't want to send that to landfill because it has uh, heavy metals. It has, uh, it, you know, it's dangerous for the people that work there. It's everything. But in reality, what happens is that every appliance and uh, equipment has its day of becoming scrap. You know, there's no way that, you know, it will last forever. You know, it's, you know, the reuse and the, the, the delay in, in, uh, in you know, ch exchanging it will end up one day, you know, this is useless. It cannot, this doesn't work. It's not worth fixing. You know, it, the, the technology has surpassed it in such a way that, you know, it doesn't run the new softwares and things like that. <clears throat> we, we have, of course, a lot of recycling benefits. You know, you, you, in steel, you have a 97% reduction in material materials. And, and then you have to think about the whole chain, you know, from the, in steel, like that, the, 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 from the iron ore mine to becoming a steel. You know, that, that consumes energy, oil, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, and other types of, uh, of, uh, of inputs. And so it, it's, it's, a, it's a very long chain that uh, has to be rebuilt. If you throw it away, if you let it rust, you know, you have to, you know, go back to the mine. If you use it and in the, fi in the final form, you can have it, you know, you, you can use it in a much more efficient way. With a lot of <coughs> reductions you see here. Uh, and then the energy also, you know, aluminum, which is, is, a, is very energy intensive, you know, as you say, 95%, copper, you say, 85%, lead, 60%, uh, zinc, 60% again, you know, and glass, and 34%, you know, so this is an input that you don't need in 
many countries, like my country is hydroelectric, is the most uh, output of uh, production of energy is out, out of hy hydroelectric, but in many, many countries, the, it's uh, oil, you know, oil or coal, and that is very pollutive, pollutant, sorry. Uh, this uh, Kroshek and Naral Gladsky, they, they developed a sustainable process index, which is a very inter interesting index because it lets you compare things. Is, this is basically, it's the, the solar energy required for uh, uh, recuperating or, you know, the, the, you know rep uh, how do you say that? I'm sorry. Uh, for, you know, It's, it's the energy you need to, to, to replace that product or to, to, to make it compatible to, to be eaten by Earth or something like that. You know? And that's, that says, and they, they measure this in, in kind of in energy by square uh, hectare, in, by hectares. And uh, you see the average today, you need 2.7 hectares uh, and you only this have 1.8 hectares of, uh, of disposable by uh, available for everyone. Uh, Egypt is in a better position. You're still, still, still not getting to the, the bad point, but uh, you have to think that you have a lot of deserts, so uh, what, you know, how does that, that goes on? Huh? China is 2.2, Brazil, where I've come from, is 2.9, India is 0 0.9, very nice. Great Britain 4.9 and USA 8. You need eight hectares per habitant to uh, recycle the, the the consumption. Well, what's the experience in the United in the European uh, community uh, is of uh, the the waste uh, electric and electronic uh, uh, collection. You know, you see that uh, Sweden has 14%, which, uh, 14 kilos, I'm sorry, 14 kilos of uh, recollection. And uh, Europe has a comprehensive legislation which has become uh, the leader in this area. And I think uh, that you know, most countries have followed it. Brazil at least has. Uh, the main characteristics of the EE system of uh, collection of we is uh, manufacturing importers <coughs> and on, uh, are the manufacturers organize a non-profit organization, you know, which is responsible, well, first, you know, the manufacturing and importers are the responsible for taking back their products. Right? That's established, right? they pay for it. And uh, so they, what they did for it, well, we, we cannot do it alone, so they established uh, firms or businesses or ONGs, uh, NGOs, right, that uh, do, uh, do the job, right? So the consumer delivers at the store, and if they change the product, or they deliver it directly to a collection center. The public collection centers rec receive about 70% of the, what is uh, waste, yeah? Stores collect another 23%, and industry directly collects only 7%. Uh, this, this, these organizations, they subcontract the transportation and the treatment, and, uh, and uh, the end of life, is, there's an end of life charge, you know, when you buy a product. You know, if you buy a, t a TV, you pay, you know, X and X euros or uh, for, for the, future processing of it. Well, in Sweden, which is the best place, and you, have a, you have a very nice uh, model of it, you know. <clears throat> you see the companies, producers, and consumers, they all uh, have their obligations. Uh, one of them, the consumers put them, return at stores or in the stores directly, or they put at municipality collection centers, right? The, there are two, LCAS and the EAF, there are two, the two companies that were established by the industry uh, to collect the, the, the waste, right? 
And uh, so it runs pretty well. You know, the companies either send directly to the, to the treatment and recycling plants. And it it's works very well that, to the point that they have 14 kilos per inhabitant uh, of collection, which is, is a lot more than uh, some countries that we think about, you know, like uh, France, 4.4, Portugal, 3.9, you know, uh, Romania, 0.8, you know. So it's, uh, they, they, they really set up a system that really works for them, and which is pretty much the same system that works in every part of the world. Well, my hypothesis was that, you know, if, we, if a private concern can build a viable system of recollection in the Rio de Janeiro area, but it, that can be translated to any place like Cairo, which Cairo, and Cairo is a fantastic place because it has 24 million inhabitants, so it has a, a fantastic amount of, of uh, production of uh, we. Well, we started with a law which is, uh, I, I don't know if you have it here in, in Egypt. And uh, the importers and distributors, uh, commercial people, uh, in, manufacturers, they're all, uh, they have to make, put up together uh, a reverse logistics uh, uh, system. Well, the, it's, it's pretty much like you saw in, in Sweden. You know, the, the consumers send the, 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 the to uh, send the equipment, the old equipment, to the retailers. And when they exchange, like when you buy a new television, you take the old television there. You know, the retailers send that to the recycling centers, right? And then man, the manufacturers and importers, they finance the, this the setup of this thing. But there's one interesting thing is that, you know, we have a shared responsibility, you know, responsibility that has to be shared between the consumer that is responsible of not throwing the thing out in the street, the public waste system that has to collect those things, you know, the manufacturers and importers and this, that's a whole, the, 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 the all, everyone has its obligation. It's not, that uh, you, you can, you know, it's the obligation zoning with industry. Well, the, this is the metropolitan area for Rio de Janeiro, which is with a white uh, outline. Uh, it's quite large. We have 12, 12 million inhabitants there, which is about half Cairo. Uh, and uh, this is, uh, I made a calculation of how much uh, per capita uh, we is generated, it's four kilos, uh, so it's five, 12 million, 46,000 uh, tons, and metals of, uh, uh, of that, metals represent 33 million, uh, uh, million tons, a uh, million kilos, right? And uh, of those, not all, everything is recoverable, uh, so you have only 26,000, and the scrap value of that is about $75 million. So you dispose, there's, there's actually, this is the money that a system, if it wants to be uh, uh, in equilibrium, has uh, to be spent. Uh, this, this shows two important things. Uh, one is that there's, there's, there's a whole, host of uh, things. The copper and uh, the, the, and the pressures metals, you know, they are you know, almost 80% uh, of this, uh, of the value of it. And uh, another thing is that, you know, the, if you mine gold in a ton of, uh, on a ton of uh, we, you will find more than in 17 tons of of uh, of, uh, met of uh, rocks. So, well, what are the cost factors to establish a, a, a business or you no know, an organization of that? You no, know, the distances and local geography are important. The population density, of course, the volume of we per person that has to be. Uh, 
and, and that is uh, a tricky thing because, uh, and I don't know if that happens here, but probably does. When you buy a new TV set, you give the old TV set to your employee that takes it to their home that is not exactly in that area where you think that it should be. You know, you, that, that we, by the calculation, you think that the waste should be. So it will become a waste, but far away. It's not uh, that a simple thing to, to establish. Where is the volume? Huh? Uh, the type of product, labor costs, and you know, uh, standards for recycling, and that's all business. Huh? Uh, this is the, the, the map of Rio de Janeiro, and that has a, a width of 50 kilometers from Petrópolis down to, oh, you see it here? Yeah, you can see it. It's down to the center of Rio, and from Mangaratiba to, uh, well, <laughs> Itaboraí. This, uh, this, so that's 120, that's, uh, no, it's nice, it's stretched and, you know, easy to handle. The density, that's population density is mostly in the center of it. Uh, we estimated the, the volume of we there by, you know, econometric calculations, and they find that the Rio de Janeiro Rio de Janeiro, uh, which is that the largest area there, and which is the largest population, has uh, 31,000 tons. It's about 70% uh, of, uh, of the total. And, okay, thank you, I'll do. Uh, then uh, you have Duque de Caxias and all, all those municipalities, and but you know, again, you, you find that, you know, the, you don't find 31,000 tons in we in, in Rio de Janeiro because that's probably moved somewhere else. Uh, what we con con we did a conceptual product uh, project that uh, the 318 managed collection points. Uh, we transport that all to a collection center uh, and processing center. Uh, industrial recyclers go up and buy the sorted material. Uh, the cost, the total cost of a, a system like that is uh, $31 million if it's totally private and uh, 21 if it's totally public. And uh, you have a break-even point of uh, 52%, which is uh, reasonable, but uh, what happens is that uh, a lot of districts will never reach break-even because they're too large, they have too little population, it's too sparse, the, the, uh, it's too disperse and then and, and uh, well the conclusions and is that a public private cooperative co cooperative, cooperative system it will work better the, the, the reason that is because it's a, the public system they have already established you know a collection uh, a, a collection to the houses so they they'll, they'll move they'll, they'll go home by home while uh, if you have a public, uh, a private uh, system, you'll have collection points where the people will have to pick up the refrigerator and take them there, and which is, of course, not as efficient as the other one. Uh, you, you've seen that uh, the valuable things are, you know, the, the, the precious metals that are inside the electronic plate, right, the, the, Right? And uh, the copper, you know, if you have uh, garbage collectors of, in the street, you know, they'll take that out to sell it uh, in the next, to the, the, you know, in the next uh, corner, and uh, then this whole system will not become sustainable. Uh, you have to charge a reverse logistic uh, uh, tax to the consumer when it buys the thing. That's, that's a very important. You can, you can have a, a, a tax that is, then that's an, is essential to establish the system, right? So you have to, you have a huge investment before reaching, you know, a, a sustainable point. And, uh, and th that should be explicit. So the consumer knows that they're paying a certain amount for that. Uh, 
well, in Brazil, the, the, the recycling uh, is, has, pays a tax, so it sh should be tax exempt. Uh, and you've seen that uh, the gold, uh, platinum, silver is in the, in the, uh, in the board. And that should, we should, you should establish here, as we should establish in Brazil, a recycling uh, and, and a refinery for that. Because that's, you know, we, in Brazil we export that, uh, we break it down and export it to Singapore, to Belgium, to United States, and, uh, and we lose, uh, we sell that scrap value gold. And that's amazing, it's just, and the a brief calculation you say you send you show that it's valued at, at least ten times more. And uh, well, the benefits for in Rio, at least, when you're going to create two thousand five hundred jobs, uh, the government will collect taxes, and uh, you'll have a lower environmental pollution. Thank you very much. Okay, um, I'm going to rush straight through, Biljana. Um, we're going to try and finish about uh, between 10 and 5, 2, and then we'll probably run 5, 10 minutes over. So we will have some questions. When the questions come in, please keep them short and quick and to the point. So you won't hear any more of me. Okay, Biljana, please. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Maurice. I have uh, the last word, but uh, that's a big challenge. I try my best uh, not to make uh, this in a borrowing, borrowing way. And uh, my impulse for the start uh, today came from uh, the sessions from Maurice, when uh, our chairman said uh, as keyword or as conclusion from his uh, talk, collaboration, collaboration, and collaboration again. And then I thought that I could speak about love and love and love again. And I'm not alone in this attitude because I remember that two years before in Basel, in the conference about the millennium goals of the planet, the very known professor, uh, Rosling from Sweden, Hans Rosling, remember this name, and maybe you can look in internet under uh, Gapminder, is it so close? He made conclusion for the whole day conference in Basel about the millennium's goal of our planet. And then he says, what do we need now? If we can say in a couple of words, we need money, we need heart, and we need brain. And because today, and yesterday and yesterday before, we talked so much about money, so much about brain in biotechnology. I take the chance now to speak about the heart. And I think that when we speak about the heart, we can to be very precisely and to learn to distinguish the language of the heart. And I'm thinking the deep level of the soul this level which is going to the one deep belief system and uh, the other way of knowledge, the factual knowledge. And that's why I think in that without heart, we are not ready, we cannot understand the world. And uh, that is my start, that understanding the world isn't the same as explaining the world. Until now, we spoke more and more about explaining the world. That there is a big dichotomy between these two ways of thinking and their languages, which affects the impact of life. The licit quantifiable way of thinking and its language, the it language, are neutral, pure, devoid of sense. With this kind of thinking, we try to explain the world. The existential, qualifiable way of thinking and its me language are personal, experience laden, and include context, symbols, 
which brings feelings, imagination, and will, and therefore new interpretation to perception. And that is a way to transform the world, to redesign the world. We have spoken so much about transformation of languages and we are so fascinating how from one language you can jump in another, in another, but how to transform our personality, how to transform our moral, to come in higher moral and to find a new perception and new interactions between these perceptions. That is what I want to, I want to invite you in this way of thinking. This way of thinking, we try to understand the world. The interrelations that we win in this way are those that will help us reconfigure life in 20th century. We have to speak about redesign, reconfigure the life, and not only to improve one system or to give addition to one deal, it's not enough nowadays. And I think that instead of always asking the questions of why catastrophes happen, we should ask ourselves why societal progress seems impossible. If we don't practice a questioning attitude, then the available knowledge will never be in accord with the people concerned. Because we have not enough time, I will jump through my slides, and then I'm ready for questions. I think it's a, a better solution for now. Communication has been interrupted, and something more than popularization or the accurate deal is needed. The knowledge isn't in accord with those concerned, and they realize this. The questioning attitude isn't practiced, Instead, that the responsibility is repressed. The questions in the large societal frames is as follows. How can the dynamic of the worldview of the attitude based on respected science influence other complexes of the global community? Here I have one uh, interesting tabel which I uh, took from my, uh, my first life in Bulgarian, and it was conference uh, 1985, uh, before the political turn in Varna, and one colleague from Aust uh, Austria, from International Institute for Applied System Analysis, uh, showed us this uh, tabel, table, and we the Bulgarian in socialistic time, we are very impressed how uh, the future will be uh, heavenly in accord with uh, our moral. And the interest, mm, it's better so. <laughs> the interesting uh, moment for me is that the matrix here is uh, in this period of time. And this matrix and this and this, they are uh, somehow intact. The uh, turning point is that if you are in uh, one attitude to speak more about terror instead about solidarity for terror, you are under the pressure of fear and you are rely on this uh, way of science, of cybernetic, big science, high technology, uh, the aims, why are not, here are the aims, the value system, I don't know why I cannot put the whole table, here is subject, object, science, information, structure. The turning point is that if you have this attitude, this worldview, you cannot come to this goal here to create a creative intellectuality. You, if you don't have new humanity here as worldview, you cannot come here. This means that we have to look for approaches which can come 
here because now we are somewhere here. It doesn't happen that we have this way of matrix and we are 2012. And uh, it's very interesting when we think in this panoramic uh, matrix way of the world. This could give uh, orientation and uh, platform for uh, solutions. And uh, I think that it's a good way to, to look at the world in this frame. That's what I say already. I'm going further. And the uh, strategy of solutions in my eyes is that biologists can open up their language to metaphors and accepted organic connections without the fear of labels such as vitalist, creationist, etc. As long as we are conscious of the fact that the depictions and metaphors aren't information about objective processes but hidden through dimensions that we can set free in our thoughts intuitively and inspirationally then we are freed of latent reductionism and then we have a better contact with the audience, with the society. If one uh, biologist uh, can show that the, the plant is, uh, the, the research of the plant is only one hypothesis, one model and not the whole plant, uh, then, uh, uh, and then much context uh, is isolated to come effectively to one detail, the public will have more trust to these scientists. And that's why I think that one of the way to have trust to each other is to use precisely language. Uh, that's why I have uh, uh, idea or proposal how the science in the 21st century uh, should look, account for the quantifiable as well as the qualifiable has to be considered. By this I also mean our immediate perceptions like it already happens in biology, not try to squeeze biology into the methods of physics, not treat languages as purely physical even if biologists are scared of being labeled as vitalist, creationist, etc. Metaphors don't depict physiological processes but important hidden truth dimensions. Here I took uh, one uh, plant of the collection of my husband Klaus Amon and I want to see how wonderful and uh, mystical and uh, animated can the, the beauty of the nature uh, uh, impressed us and the same in the same way the people can impress us if we have empathy and uh, solidarity to each other because the fear is a not good emotion to come from information to action that is for sure The interest in the other person is the force that keeps us alive. The meaning of your own fate cannot only be found in yourself, but also in the relationship with other people, in the dialogue and responsible initiative. Uh, another way of uh, solving the problems, I find again if the, in the model of uh, uh, Horse Rittel, one of the genius people in, in this, uh, in the last society, in the last 20, uh, in the 20th century, he, he, he died in uh, 1990, but uh, I, I have the chance to know him and admire him uh, even in the socialistic time. And when I came here, uh, I visit him and it's really a genial model. Uh, now I will show quickly the steps of uh, his uh, model of solving the problems. He uh, create five steps of uh, conversation, of dialogue, and uh, every, um, 
every attach, every sort of the, of the question has another uh, knowledge, a tip and another language, and we have not to mix them. Uh, the first is what is the problem is the factual knowledge. Uh, then the second step, what we want to achieve, and this denotative knowledge is the, the knowledge when we begin to uh, describe the problem, to describe our wishes and our imagination start to be uh, activate and to bring solutions. Uh, what are the alternatives, explanatory knowledge, we start to bring values and rational arguments in the alternatives and to look how they are in uh, cooperation or in competition, of course, between. Then is coming the step, how do we compare them? Is the instrumental knowledge, what we have, how can we deal with the problem? How are the costs when we can start? And the last is how do we achieve them? is the conceptual knowledge. And here the concept is as a result of one process. And that's why I mean that when the logical culture has to discipline us to uh, be, uh, uh, not to give answer before the, the question came, that the question needs time to uh, grow up. And then uh, it is, of course, that true that one optimistic solo, I mean me, doesn't make an optimistic summer, but there may be two or three solos, which I hope will be the case. And this will open the way of a useful integrity and a valuable pluralism in the decisions making process. And uh, I want to say that the science has not the authority to present integrity of the life, but is very, very useful when we can put her in, the, uh, in this matrix of steps. And I wish that we are more solos here. And yesterday I was on one tour in the library that I saw one beautiful icon. And that's my present for you in Alexandria to know that you have here this in the uh, Antiquities Museum in Byzantic uh, collection. Uh, and uh, the, the icon depicts Jesus Christ sitting on the throne of glory, surrounded by the symbols of the four evangelists, the face of a man symbolizing uh, Matthew, I think, yes, uh, uh, the face of the lion symbolizing Mark, the face of the bull symbolizing Luke, Evangelium, and the face of the eagle symbolizing uh, Johann, John. The Chris holds an open book, and now is the glue. The artist edit in red, may go through art, the one who endures. That's what is important in the life. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bugana. Um, okay, I'm trying to. I'm going to try and uh, keep my questions short and, and purely be a chairman. Um, so, it, more of a comment, really, to Claudio. One of the things that I noticed was that um, astounding success in signing up various companies in, in a short space of time. Five years to go from. I can't remember all the different categories, but repeatedly quadrupled. 600, 2,400, 5,000. So there's obviously an impetus and a requirement for that. Um, one of the things I always feel, and this is a, a question, is that is this possible to translate into developing and emerging countries? Is it right for us to assume that a developed country has already benefited from the time and the experience and we expect the emerging market to be able to conform and, and indeed uh, comply with our desires to have a corporate social responsibility. Sorry. I'm not so optimistic for a, for a moment because uh, uh, this deal with uh, many, many, many issues which is quite difficult uh, to achieve in my opinion. I think that we have to 
produce uh, more concerns that we have today, and uh, that will be uh, the very beginning for a process of developing process, uh, even in the in the in the in the developing country. <coughs> the problem we have, which I try to show, uh, is. Uh, to produce overseas and uh, uh, gather reputation uh, in the homeland, which is, most, which is, which is uh, among the most problems we, we have to deal with at the moment, because how can you, how can you reproduce a model of uh, CSR in developing countries where you have used developing countries for your uh, bad, let's say, production, your bad behavior? Uh, was it a question? I think um, so. I think we have a question. Is this relevant now or no? To sorry, to the gentleman behind. Sorry. Yes. Um, my question is about co corporate social responsibility. Um, how would you convince? How would you convince? Okay. How would you convince um, a corporate shareholder who cares about his money to invest in corporate social responsibility, which may not get his money back? Uh, probably I was not explaining too much, thanks to Mr. Chairman, uh, I'm joking, uh, <laughs> how I meant, I'm wearing uh, my capitalist hat, yeah, how I meant for uh, making CSR as a source of a business. I can tell you a story, I, 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 don't, I don't know actually now because Boundary conditions has changed much than much more than in the 70s and 60s, but I can I can give you an example. Uh, can you remember maybe or do you know how uh, the, the the detergents phosphorus free were introduced? Well, it was in the 60s, and it became a way for compete between uh, among companies. So they were the first. It was Dixon, the very famous Procter Gamble products. But they say, okay, uh, phosphorus is uh, endangering the water because when you use your washing machine and you discharge water after after the running of the washing machine, the phosphorus is uh, affecting the environment. Oh my goodness! So the very first who start in this made the phosphorus free detergents a business. And all the others were, were, were coming afterward, coming afterward, but it was the very first, uh, the first uh, uh, mover in the, in, the, in, the, in, in the market. So they, they gained a lot of popularity in terms of visibility, in terms of advertising, in terms of revenues, you know? So what I think that we should imagine something to, intro to be introduced uh, in the companies, and I don't know, but the problem is, that is the quarterly report. This is the main problem. The quarterly report means that when you have uh, a managing director of a public company, which is uh, dealing with his own problems, because it's a three years time, he has stock options. He has to get the maximum revenue because it, when he's living, he has to get the most money he can. So that's quite impossible to realize. But apart from that, uh, I think that there are many, there are many possibilities. And um, now um, when you have, you know, due to the crisis, you have a lot of investors of institutional investors, public fund. That could be the leverage to convince uh, boards and managing directors to act more uh, politely, let's say. Huh? And answer your question? Yes, but, but um, do you believe it's more like perceiving them into doing corporate social responsibility projects, or is it public pressure? We can like uh, force no. them into doing this. 
I don't think public pressure, well, you can, public pressure doesn't work. Uh, you know, when they started, they decided not to buy Coke. What happens? Nothing happens. When they decide to boycott McDonald's, what happens? Nothing. How, how long can you boycott or do something like that? It doesn't uh, work. I'm not sure if this is true here, but in the UK at the moment, there are systems, I mean, I think this comes into Joao's point here, but just trying to tie the two together. Um, you know, Joao's comment of hands up who's got, I mean, we get a new phone every year, it seems, a new mobile phone, you know, two years. I mean, I have a drawer full of them. Um, and, you know, they are full of components of gold and platinum, whatever, for, you know, so, what is interesting is there are already a business for people collecting those phones to strip them, to recover all the parts, whatever, which is very important. So I think had that been forced, it might not have happened, but somebody's seen an opportunity to be socially responsibly, dare I say, but also to make money and return good back into society. Um, there is, however, a double catch to this. I lived in New York 10, 12 years ago. And um, they spent a lot of time trying to ed educate New Yorkers, who are probably, it's probably the throwaway society, apart from maybe Japan or Japan was. And they finally started recycling, as in separating their trash, as they call it, their rubbish. Uh, and Giuliani spent a lot of time, uh, came in and dropped it. So they spent all that time and all that money educating, maybe five or six years, educating New Yorkers to actually separate their glass and so enforcing it. And then they pulled it away and they just went back to throwing it in and putting it in a landfill. So I think that sometimes there is a, there's a dichotomy between what you can hope to achieve, but also uh, what it's a, it's a push-pull thing. Is that, is that, would that be right to say it's a push-pull scenario? Sorry. Sorry, please. Well, it's about corporate ethics here. You may not know that uh, there is a global uh, initiative uh, from... Uh, Hans Kung and uh, Klaus Leisinger uh, both spoke here several times uh, about uh, global corporate ethics movement, which is taken very serious by the big corporations, but that's coming from the top. And I frankly say don't know uh, where that will end. Uh, but there are other things where uh, corporates swiftly react. That's uh, accusations about child labor and uh, really hot issues uh, where the public is immediately dismayed and protests. There the corporates react quite swiftly now. But it's true that uh, I have seen it with the boss of uh, Monsanto uh, several times under four eyes. I spoke to him, but then uh, he again contacted his, uh, I called them the shareholder crocodiles. Uh, and then the whole beautiful vision uh, was gone again. Thank you. Um, does anybody, sorry, the gentleman in the middle there, the T-shirt green, that thread, please. Hi, uh, I want to make a comment actually, it's addressed to Dr. Jaco. Uh, okay, so uh, living in a poor country like Egypt, I remember 10 years ago when I used to buy a new desktop uh, computer actually, uh, we, d we didn't use to buy a full computer, we used to buy uh, parts. So, and we uh, put these parts together and I actually uh, think that many people in this uh, room have made this by their hands. It's still going on in Egypt, actually, because, uh, well, I, 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 a full computer will cost me the salary of me for two months. So it's, I want to buy, go buy a new computer every, every single year or something. So we upgrade our computers. Why don't we find uh, a mobile that I could, up be, could upgrade? a mobile that I could uh, work off and put parts in it. Actually, uh, I will find uh, the, both the... Is this working? Yes, both the fine. producer and me will benefit from it because uh, he will produce more and sell more, sell parts 
actually? I, th I think uh, but I think two things here. Number one, I think you know the fact is that a, a corporation wants you to buy a new product every year. That's what they want. Their shareholders want. It doesn't make it right. Uh, secondly, in the West in particular, we're lazy. We're not going to sit there and rebuild our own computers and whatever. I've got too much time to waste watching Chelsea, except for, you know, <laughs> that's the second time I've mentioned that, and I'm going to mention it again. So yeah. I'm very happy. I'm still smiling about this. But, uh, uh, and uh, and I, think, I think what you're saying is absolutely right, but I think you'll also find that there are people who can do that in certain the UK and Germany and whatever who do build their own... Uh, computer systems and have far much more power than is available in a laptop that you can buy or whatever, far much more. I think the problem perhaps is that you're looking at uh, having the box in the first place to put all the extra components in and how neat and I think you had the aesthetic slide up. So, do yeah. I'll But, but uh, that's not only that. Uh, it's <clears throat> you, you would have to... to Really, you know, if you do that, uh, you start uh, uh, retarding uh, technology up upgrade. You know, uh, you know, you can, you can, okay, you, uh, in a computer, you can, you can change the board with the, the processor right. and those things. But can you do that with a TV? Can you do that with your refrigerator? And so it gets to to be too uh, complicated and it ends up, uh, you know, retarding the, the development. Question at the back. Sorry. Do, do Some, oh, sorry. I, I, another thing. I, I wish Very short, this please. Thing. Sorry. I want to show you one slide. Actually, it's inspired me to say this, but I don't know if this is working or not. I have no idea if that works. I mean, you're the technical guru. Oh. So, okay. So, I'm sorry, but perhaps if you can show that later. After okay. The, sorry. Okay. Sorry. Can we take the question at the back quickly? I, I, we did start late, so I'll go five minutes late, if that's okay. Uh, sorry. Very interesting case, but I think that there are plenty of examples where public opinion uh, has an impact on corporations uh, that uh, need uh, to promote uh, their corporate image. Uh, uh, let's remember South Africa apartheid uh, and uh, people dropping, uh, buying uh, stocks of a uh, uh, country that uh, did the business uh, with uh, South Africa. The grape uh, boycott in California that actually was very successful and so forth. And also, all corporations uh, invest a lot of money uh, into corporate image uh, and uh, with the social media, public opinion uh, is uh, uh, multiplied uh, a hundredfold. So perhaps, uh, uh, although people don't necessarily do good uh, for uh, their good heart, uh, but maybe people in the corporate business uh, can be motivated uh, by winning uh, approval and uh, rewarded uh, by more gains, uh, by being uh, acceptable in the mind of the consumer. So the consumer have a lot of power, in my opinion. Uh, just, I, I just want to, we haven't had any uh, questions specifically for um, Biljana. So uh, after all, she did state in not her own words, but I'm going to state it. She's our guru of love here today. She mentioned love three times. Um, I don't think any of us are adverse to that. So, um, you know, in what you're trying to uh, get across in the use of language uh, and, and understanding, what do you take out of this event as a whole, not just this session, but in your area of expertise? What do you, what is your message to, to people in, in the context of humanizing the science? My first time when uh, I was here in Alexandria, it was uh, Darby Now conference, and then now and then uh, I uh, I spoke about evolution and involution. Uh, 
uh, and uh, evolution of uh, expanding the spirit outside in material way and evolution expanding the spirit inside of the soul. And nowadays I think that uh, in this uh, view vision 2012, we can speak about mm, the power of transformation of languages as well the power of transformation of, uh, of moral. It's worth to make one uh, uh, task to, uh, to accept, to realize the knowledge in a bright sense of the word as cognition and then how to turn the cognition in love. That's my message, yes. How to turn the cognition in love. <laughs> okay. uh Christian, sorry, I, uh, sorry, I, I beg your pardon. Uh, Christian, please. I'll, I'll be relatively brief. Uh, it's just an observation. You said relatively. <laughs> I said relatively. I'll be as brief as I'm capable of being, which is reasonable. Um, this has been an interesting session. Um, I'm going to comment from the point of view of biotech and biopharma because that's what I know. Um, I, I think there are, you know, we can have a lot of discussions about the motivations of large companies and how to impact them and I agree societal efforts have had real results and co some companies are doing some good things but I'd like to boil it down to us and to the people in this room and to the researchers working on biotechnology whether agricultural, industrial, uh, biomedical, pharmaceutical. Um, when I take, and I suspect it's the same for Morris because I, I know him rather well, um, he may disagree just for fun, but when I take a mandate with a company or a project, um, I have an evaluation I go through. One of the key things, in addition to the project, the science, the business opportunity, and the people, because that has to be somebody I want to work with, uh, one of the things that's very important is what are you going to do? And I have no interest in getting involved in any business that's not going to create some value other than just money. Money's great. I'd like more of it. Thank you very much. But I'm not going to spend my time on something just because it creates money if it doesn't create any other value. And, you know, we talk about investors and some of us here who negotiate with them can be critical of them. I have heard venture capitalists on occasion ask, how are you going to make money? And in that point, they're asking about what is the business model? but I have never had a meeting with one of them where they don't want to know, first and foremost, what are you going to do, what need are you going to solve? If it's not focused on the patients, if it's not focused on society or some societal or human need, there's no interest. And I think if we can reinforce that at an individual level with each one of us, try to look at our own research and say, how can we apply this to most benefit? What's the business model we can do you know, we can implement that's going to create the most value. Well, you're going to feel good. You're going to do well while doing good. And frankly, you're probably going to be more successful because if you've identified a real need where you're improving something or adding value, there is going to be a better business model there. Um, I agree with you. I'll actually add to that. I think um, all of you out there, whatever you do, and this is aimed at students, Whatever you're trying to sell, and I don't mean that in necessarily monetary terms, but if you're not passionate, why would anybody be interested in you? So I started saying that ask questions, but the other thing that's really, really important, and I guess this is going back to humanizing science in that way, but you have to inject passion. If you're a robot or robotic in the way you speak, why is anybody going to show any interest in you? And I absolutely mean that. So. You know, if you enjoy what you're doing, then yes, it's hard. You will always have times that are difficult. But you know what, if you enjoy what you're doing, then frankly, at the end of the day, you know, go and sit down, relax, read a book, whatever. But actually think about what you're doing and why you're doing it and what you want to do it for. Because if you can do that, then other people will see that value. Um, now, finally, there's a rather lovely lady at the back who's been waiting very patiently uh, to ask a question. So I think it'll be the final question of the day, so, oh, sorry, okay, but if, if you can ask your question, perhaps we'll put the, so please ask yours, and then I, I will go straight to you as well, right? Thank, thank you. <coughs> Dalia Saad, Sudanese, and postgrad student at Wits Johannesburg. Uh, I would 
uh, I would like to ask uh, for a general advice for young, for us as a young researcher, about how to to take our research to to the market. And I also want to comment on on this about. Uh, I think we we need an urgent uh, implementation for environmental laws, because otherwise I think. Uh, companies, industry, they only, they don't care about environment. They care about their profits. So uh, unless we have uh, strict environmental regulations, we don't, we, we can't achieve this, uh, especially in developing countries. Uh, I would like just to, to give an example. Uh, in my country, in Sudan, uh, the shortage of water has been for a long uh, source of conflict uh, in some areas. Uh, and funny enough, in same area, uh, there is the oil field where huge amount of produced water uh, generated. And easily this, this produced water uh, could be treated and solve the, the conflict. So I think this is uh, very, very important. Thank you. Thank you. Um, sorry, sir, you are the last question of the day. I promised you. Please keep it brief. Uh, doctors, uh, do you think that the world does need further growth or we have to adjust our lifestyle? Because I have, re I have read a study that, uh, stating that the world can carry about 15 billion Chinese and about the same number of Indians, but only 3 billion of Americans. So what do you think, Professor? Are there any Americans in the room? <laughs> okay, so we can say what we like then. Um, no. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that assumes Chinese don't change the way they live, which they're doing every year. I think, I think, uh, to put this in context, right, or well, maybe another context, you know, the, the, the Chinese are building coal power stations at the rate of 53 or 56 a year. They're enormous. They're ginormous. And they spew out as much... Uh, environmentally half, harmful con, you know, content as, as is possible. However, I've always thought this, and I still kind of think there is a dichotomy. Yes, we can educate them, but are we going to slow down their progress in their evolution? I mean, how are we going to turn around and say, no, you can't use this energy or, or, or whatever it may be? So there has to be a mix, I feel, of understanding. So it, it, it's, yes, there's regulation, but, you know, does that then not become... If you're regulating against an emerging country, at what point are you actually impeding their development by denying them what a so-called so -called developed country in the West or whatever has had already, has had the benefit from? So I think, different. Does, do you, does anybody have a comment on that to finish up? And in fact, uh, I think we yes, should probably yes. last minute comments, sorry. So. Uh, you saw that sustainability, absorption was the word I was looking for, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, that's it, you know, you, you, you have to, to, you cannot, everyone cannot become an American in, consum in, in terms of, of uh, consumption. But uh, what we'll have to do is, is work out this, because the, 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 this is, is a goal to everyone. Everyone wants to have a new car, everyone wants to have a new beautiful house, everyone wants to travel in the same way as Americans do. They, they sold their, their style of life for, you know, many years. So, uh, but this, there's going to be, have to be restraint. You know, you have to have, be happy with a lot less than what you would like to have. Claudio, would you like to, well, a final point? Well, uh, thank you. Well, I, I will just make a final remark uh, about the relationship uh, between uh, sustainable development and corporate social responsibility, uh, which is uh, is a mistake to consider CSR as a part of the corporate image program for a corporation. This is not true. This is wrong. Because we have not only the needs uh, to, 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 to gain accountability in terms of corporate image, but that means that the, the environment, the workers, the employees, and uh, whatever related to their family, to their program, 
to the assistance they need will be done. And this is not rewarding in terms of corporate image. It's a cost. But it's a cost investment, let's say, because people working in that condition will be much more favorable to work in that company and maybe became more productive. This is the, this is the question. So um, many times I, ha I heard about, about this confusion between the two, the two uh, concepts. Now, that can apply to advertising, I'm right. It's a lot. Uh, the company um, produce uh, uh, gasoline or so. Well, no, we're not polluting. We have uh, uh, 0 0.0000 sulfur, et, et cetera. Okay, that's right. But this is advertising. This is not corporate social responsibility. Uh, many, many corporations, starting from Coca-Cola, have understood that this uh, could help, and they uh, have commenced to, 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 to do something uh, uh, after the tsunami population, et cetera, I'm, I'm, I have to stop. Okay. Ren? Okay. Um, so from Mr. Relationship to Miss Love, um, Biliana, would you like to say one last comment or are you okay? to speak to uh, this observer, but I think that uh, we can work on one attitude to, uh, to see the world as a construction of options and that we have a right to choose the options which we like. That's it. And not to be victim of the storm, but uh, to have the attitude, the world, is constriction of options there, this and this and this, and to have right to work and to mobilize ourselves for one chosen of us options. That's it. <laughs> okay. All right, thank you very much. I'm very sorry that we're a bit delayed, but um, uh, it's the last track, it's the last session of last track of the last day, so thank you very much for staying.